I've talked ad nauseum at this stage about how much I love Black Rack's Volumetric Clouds mod, in combination with all the other visual mods we now have for Kerbal Space Program, but one of the issues that I have is that my missions often don't really showcase them for very long, because I just launch a rocket that takes mere seconds to leave the ground, punch through the clouds, and then just leaves all those gorgeous visuals behind. Which is a shame, because the clouds and the weather effects that this mod adds are so cool. Something that I really felt internally resonate when filming the next Kerbal video I'll be posting very soon, which is uh, already available if you're a Patreon or YouTube channel member by the way, wink wink, check the links below and all that, in which I piloted a little space plane through a horrific thunderstorm and, you know, it was awesome! And it made me want to do a video featuring a plane and, you know, fly through the cloud and atmosphere and all that good stuff. But also, like, this is Kerbal Space Program. You gotta go to space, right? So what's the compromise? Well, I decided to try a satellite launcher, which is something I've done before, but with a brand new caveat. It has to deliver payload to space without the use of any oxidizer, i.e. this is powered by jet engines only. Just good old liquid fuel and the air we breathe. Obviously, we can't place payload in a stable orbit without some rocket propellant, so the idea here is to fly the jet to space on a suborbital trajectory, then deploy the payload, which will then perform a circularization burn. We will then switch back to the jet before it re-enters the atmosphere and kind of despawns, and perform a controlled re-entry, and then return back to the Kerbal Space Center for the next flight. That's right, unlike a lot of my airplane launched rockets, no quick saving and quick loading will be needed to demonstrate recovery of the aircraft and the spacecraft, which in real life would mean losing one or the other depending on the timeline. Now, if I'm going for a jet fuel only design, then why am I using the rapier engines, which of course have both an air breathing and a closed cycle mode, instead of a pure air breathing jet engine like the Whiplash. After all, the rapier engine in jet plane mode does seem inferior to the Whiplash. It's heavier, has poorer thrust at takeoff, and creates a lot more drag and isn't as efficient. However, it has some serious upsides, namely that after Mach 1, it produces a lot more thrust and can get you around 200 meters per second faster overall than the Whiplash can in air breathing mode, and considering we have to get ourselves on a space-bound trajectory within the first 20 to 25 kilometers of altitude, after which we'll run out of air to provide oxygen, we will need all of the speed and thrust that we can get. Which is why I fitted this thing with a whopping 8 rapier engine, so we can get as fast as physically possible. But looking at the screen right now, it looks like we have now completed construction of the aircraft. I did make the last minute addition of a four seat crew module behind the cockpit, just thinking from a business perspective, right, we could get a little bit more money for our space program by having four tourists on board this thing, like Virgin Galactic style, where they can say they were astronauts or something, or if we're flying a scientific payload for NASA or someone, we can have some mission specialists or scientists and engineers in the crew module to help well, I guess help, help with the mission, I suppose. As for the mission for the demonstrator flight, we're going straight for a crude launch. Um, this isn't the final iteration of the rocket. I didn't, like, design this plane and then build it again and film it. I just sort of winged it and hoped it would work. So you're watching the first take of me building it here. So right now it's just the Mercury-style cockpit with a small scientific payload, but I thought that would be kind of boring. Let's do, like, a miniature space station. Was, was my idea. So we've got a little two-seat crew module there slash stand-in for a laboratory. We then have a, most of the scientific equipment strapped to the booster, and I thought that'd be a pretty, that'd be a pretty nifty payload to fly on our first flight. So to reiterate, the uh, space station is going to perform the orbital circularization. The jet is just going to get us on a suborbital trajectory. And, you know, I'm, I was Pretty happy with how the design ended up coming out. It looks a little bit goofy having all of those engines strapped to the back, but I think overall it looks pretty nice. I was quite happy with how it turned out. As I really, really like the fact we've got that four seat crew module behind the cockpit as well. But as you can see, construction has pretty much wrapped up so we can crossfade over to that beautiful shot of us getting ready on the runway. I mean, my goodness, to this day, I mean, with the help of mods admittedly, but to this day, KSP just, it's still so good, isn't it? Especially compared to KSP2. 
Man, sometimes I want to just learn how to code so I can have a crack at making a better spiritual successor myself. And a great way to get started would be with Boot.dev. It's an awesome platform that makes learning back-end development fun by teaching you the Python and Go programming languages from start to finish in a way that makes it feel more like playing a captivating RPG than simply poring over textbooks. Because the team behind it know that the best way to teach is to make it fun and to make sure that you're never bored. And Boot.dev will have you writing tons of code. Because the the only way to learn programming is to actually get stuck in with hands on the keyboard and get shipping projects. Programming is a fantastic skill to have and can lead to a great career. According to Stack Overflow, the median salary for a back-end developer in the US in 2023 was six figures. And Boots.dev isn't a gimmick. They are truly dedicated in making sure the lessons that you learn delve deep and take the time to hammer in the fundamentals. To give you job-ready programming skills, all while keeping things exciting and keeping you motivated to keep leveling up and they even do bi-monthly boss fights where the community rallies together to gain bonus xp for each lesson completed during the event honestly programming is such an amazing skill to have in this current age so click the link in the description box and use my code matt Lown to get 25 percent off your first month or even your entire first year if you choose the annual plan okay so here we are ready to go Those uh, waterfall effects of the engines are really, really good. But uh, yeah, we have quite high thrust. We're going to have no problems whatsoever taking off on the runway here. And we can uh, retract our landing gear and then maintain somewhat level flight until we reach supersonic speeds to unlock the full thrust potential of those rapier engines, which we are, are reaching very rapidly. So I'm going to go through my crew roster real quickly. We've got Valentina, uh, me. We've got some tourists. We've got Barry. Sheila, Jeff, and Richard, and our two astronauts aboard the space station, Bill and Bob. And whilst I was doing that, we have now reached pretty high speeds. We're going to very slowly, we're going to toggle on fine controls. We're going to very slowly start pointing to 45 degrees. I, I was trying to go gently so I don't get too much g-force. This would have been a great uh, opportunity to use my uh, joystick, actually, that I had built for KSP-1. But I guess we're using the keyboard now, so... Yeah. So once we get to 45 degrees, really try to avoid putting too much stress on the airframe. Uh, okay, we get to 45 degrees. Which basically is rapidly tapping uh, S with the fine controls. Now I'm going to keep an eye on the temperature gauges here. We don't want to overheat and explode, but look at our up height. We are well in space there. And I imagine we're about to hit flame out with those engines as well. Yep, that's flame out there, so we can shut them all down and point prograde to minimize our drag. And there we have it. We are on our way to space. Now, I mentioned, guys, that obviously I am on board, and this is so I can kind of communicate with our tourists. So let me go ahead and just do that now. Uh, so thank you for flying Laon Aerospace, our most esteemed guests. I'm actually going to go say hello to them. Or you, I guess, because I'm doing a, a bit right now. Hello, esteemed guests, Barry, Sheila, Jeff, and Richard. We are now comfortably on our way to space. Um, we do, time is of the essence here, though, so we've got to deploy our payload. So let's stop messing around too much and uh, get ready. So the first thing we're going to do, actually, let's just time it we're truly in space. And then it's kind of all hands on deck very quickly. So I've made sure my throttle is set to maximum. Phase one is opening up our cargo bay. Phase two is, uh, oh, probably should have dampened the hinge speed of that. Uh, just time what to time that. And then phase three is deployment. Now, why didn't that work? There we are. <laughs> we have deployed the payload. Excellent. So let's go for an apoapsis height of 100, because that seems, oh, I should say 100. 100 kilometers because that seems like a nice round number doesn't it in fact we should probably be going just flat there we are got our tear engine powering us here as you can see we're not m m raising our apoptosis too much because look how kind of not arch shaped our orbit is here so there we go apoptosis of 100 so let's go and create a maneuver perfect oh not perfect 
There we go, that's broadly circular, so it's a, a long old burn. This is not a very efficient flight, but it is in the sense of, like, cost, because we did most of the work using jet engines, which is a cheaper way of flying, I guess, than an expendable rocket. So we're going to start our burn. There we are. How are we doing for electric charge? I don't think we've got too much electric charge on board this thing, but that's okay because... Aha! We have a magnetometer boom, and we also have solar panels, and we have our science experiments, which uh, now I see I shouldn't have put the magnetometer boom just here because it sort of looks a bit rubbish clipped in like that, but, you know, you live and learn, don't you? Um, yeah, let's just uh, do some physics time. We'll just speed this burn process up because I'm acutely aware that while we're doing this, the jet is gradually hurtling back towards the atmosphere. What's its altitude currently? Uh... 87 and falling, so we've not got too much time left, but there's also not much time left on the burns. We should be okay That's a circuit orbit there 95 104, you know what? I'm calling that there. Oh, oh don't want a time warp. <laughs> don't want a time warp That's a good altitude for our little space station here Where now activities I guess can commence. We will cut back to our brave astronauts. Ah, it's about to enter the atmosphere <gasps> 72 kilometers <laughs> Oh there we are. So we're just going to wait for the loading screen to pass. I'm also going to make a quick save as well. Quick save one. And uh, yeah, we can close the cargo bay again, reset the hinge location, and get to talking to our crew. So uh, hello once again, esteemed guest. That completes the spaceflight portion of your flight. I hope the 30 million was well worth it for the price of the ticket. Now we're just going to do a, a fairly steep re-entry, to be honest, because we've got to get back to the Kerbal Space Centre which is in the opposite direction, like, to our head current heading. So we're going to have to do some sort of crazy backflip manoeuvre in the atmosphere. It's going to be very dangerous. We're probably going to enter a stall. So, you know, that's fun. I hope you enjoy. Um, drinks and snacks will be on their way shortly. <laughs> okay, so now comes the the process of re-entry. I might cut to... Um, post not live commentary Matt whilst I concentrate on not stalling this thing uh over to you editor Matt <laughs> thanks Matt as you can see from the footage which I can now speed up a little bit now that we're not in live commentary mode I was not in fact successful at avoiding a stall but stalling the aircraft did actually reduce the flight time since the stall killed our forward velocity pretty much on a dime, so I was able to quickly nose down to regain control, helped by the rear air brakes that create lots of drag at the rear of the airframe to assist with aborting the stall, and then we could begin the long journey back to the Kerbal Space Center. Now in my uh, naivety, I was like, let's try and do this realistically. So I've just got two rapier engines, which are enough to sustain kind of somewhat fast and level flight at a nice stable around five kilometer altitude. But it actually took ages. Like, I've sped the footage up massively here. It's currently playing back 25 times faster than normal speed. Um, I'm now going to drop that speed up, speed up down a little bit because I, I looked at the map screen, realized I was basically nowhere near the Kerbal Space Center, and I was like, you know what? I have a life that I want to lead, and so I'm just going to speed things up for myself. So I decided to basically do a repeat of the flight plan that got us here in the first place, and that is just basically firing up the rapiers and getting our apparatuses nice and high, and then just doing this big sort of arcing cruise trajectory to get us back to the Kerbal Space Center. And you know, we are hosting tourists at the end of the day, you know, Barry, Sheila, Jeff and Rich uh, are all kind of excited to see the flames of the heating on their windows there. As we uh, do, we're not quite getting into space, but it's it's close enough, right? If it were me, I would love to see, uh, like, fly in a plane at this this kind of altitude. Like that, um, oh, what's it called? The U-2 plane. There's a video, well, a video, a TV show in which uh, James May was flown up to, like, the maximum altitude of the U-2 spy plane. And it was like being in space, it looked so cool. I would love an opportunity like that. And so what I'm saying is my, my tourist passengers should be grateful that I've blessed upon them this opportunity for another kind of high altitude flight and then i saw the kerbal space center's runway looming ahead below the cloud so now it's a case of just deploying the rear air brakes once again to decelerate and head towards the runway for our landing <laughs> i don't know why i needed to elaborate what i would in fact be doing on the runway but there you go although i, I say it, i'm going to be landing on the runway 
might, might not necessarily be a completely true statement. We'll just uh, stop the speed up a little bit now as we showcase our touchdown. Yeah, a touchdown very close to the end of the runway. So I deployed our two rear drogue chutes and, and then I, <laughs> in a panic, uh, increased the braking power of the rear wheels. But sadly, it was absolutely fine. As you can see, we land, we came to a complete touchdown on the runway. We didn't overshoot. So, um, so yeah, I was pretty happy with that flight. The tourists are all super duper excited to, you know, be back home. But of course, this is not the end of the mission because, of course, we launched two astronaut Kerbals into space on a little mini space station. So let's go ahead and check in on how they're doing aboard their spacecraft. There it is there. So kind of cozy living quarters, but, you know, they're not going to be in space for very long, so they can manage. Sometimes it takes crews a long time to get to the ISS in real life on tiny little capsules, so this is fine. I mean, the uh, the crew compartment, I now think about it, has only got two chairs and nothing else. Like, there's no toilet facilities or ways of getting dr drinks. Uh, there's no food. Um, so, so maybe they're not the nicest. It's not the nicest place to be, but again, it's only a short flight. I'm sure they will manage. And Kerbals, ah, oh, look at their little portraits at the bottom right under the screen. They're loving it. And whilst they're enjoying things, I'm just frantically running all the science experiments that we've got here. I did briefly think about um, transmitting it all back to the Kerbal Space Center, but I was like, oh, hang on, I remember now. I can transfer the data onto the capsule, and so the capsule will be returning. I'm not, you know, evil and leave like I was just stuck in or bit forever on this tiny little capsule um, they can return to Kerbin and bring all the data back with them so as you can see I went on a brief free IVA float around the capsule but I couldn't see I couldn't see Kerbin so I'm just rotating the spacecraft now so that when our Kerbals leave their seats they can go ahead look out the window and look down at their home possibly even get the overview effect and there we are I don't know which one I'm controlling am I controlling Bill or Bob yeah, they look the same don't they is that racist? Hopefully not. Let's uh, let's get Bill slash Bob seated before um, before we get cancelled here. It was it was Schrodinger's Bob. I'm gonna call that phenomenon. Now um, we've only got 15 units of electric charge on board the probe that you know is powering this whole thing. Bill and Bob are in a crew compartment, but it is just that a crew compartment, not a command module. So we are fully dependent on having that probe core have electric charge. And I kind of wanted to splash down with electric charge remaining, which meant I had to go for a very, very, very steep re-entry profile. As you can see, our electric charge is rapidly running down. So I was like, oh, cow. I mean, to be perfectly clear, we don't need electric charge. Like, we've armed the parachute. This would have worked if we had no electric charge remaining, but I thought it would be kind of fun. Like, oh, can we splash down and still have electricity so that Bill and Bob can, I don't know, have the lights remain on? Even though I think the lights would stay on even with electric charge, and I don't even have the lights turned on, so this is not a very good example. But here we are, splashing down, it was all fine, I'll put the probe in hibernation mode, and then the electric charge should freeze. Now I said at the beginning of this video, that I wanted to showcase the amazing weather that comes with Black Rack's stock volumetric clouds. And while we did see a few storm clouds, we didn't really get a really, really bad storm. So now I'm going to launch again, but doing a military contract, top secret, launch of a top secret airfield where there is bad weather as you can see the weather is far from ideal at our top secret military launch base but that doesn't matter because we have been asked by king and country to launch a spy satellite with big urgency we cannot wait for the weather to get better and so here we are launching our top secret payload we're going to be launching it into a polar orbit let's go We are off. I've learned from the previous flight that we're actually going to keep this thing on half throttle, at least until we've retracted our landing gear fully, because it did look a little bit silly going so fast with our landing gear still sticking out all unaerodynamic like There we are, leaving the ground just as the runway ran out, so that was lucky as we head into the storm. So it's going to start flying relatively flat. We can throttle up the engines to max as well, and then once we kind of ramp up our speed we can then start pitching up towards 45 degrees now the military desert airfield actually is already putting us on a polar orbit trajectory we're heading south so we haven't got to do any banking or turning to reach our target 
orientation. And ready, we're about to punch through the clouds, leaving that foul weather far behind us. There we are. She is a thing of beauty. So, there are some differences in this vehicle compared to the civilian slash commercial version we flew on the previous flight. For starters, we have military insignia and the flag of our country. We also have a different crew on board. So, on board we still have Valentina and myself piloting the vessel. But then the passenger bay features, I've got to keep an eye on these temperature gauges actually, uh, engineers from the military company that built the spy satellite. And uh, we also have Barry again, the tourist. Uh, he really liked the previous flight, wanted to come on another flight, and we liked Barry, so Barry's with us as well. Hopefully he doesn't uh, leak important military information about this top secret spy satellite that we are launching. But there we are, the main phase of the flight, at least to begin with, is complete. We have engine flame out, and of course our apparatus height is truly in space. So we will be deploying the satellite into space. I didn't think that sentence through very well. Right, so I'm making a quick save. Now we're going to open up the payload bay doors. Extend the satellite launching arm. And deploy. Whoop! We lost the hinge, but otherwise all fine. Let's go back to the satellite and perform our circularization. I really thought 50% throttle would be okay, but I guess not. So let's raise our apoapsis to 100 kilometers once again, like we did before. Oh, that was weird. I was looking for like the equatorial plane. Of course, we are going into a polar orbit, aren't we? So actually, we want to be a little bit more exactly along the 180 degree vector on the nav ball, don't we? So time is sort of of the essence here. But we have plenty of delta V. So whilst performing our initial burn, we're going to now deploy the instrumentation of our spy satellite. There we are. It's uh, probe controlled, but we do have a crew module there in case we want to send a maintenance crew. Or, you know, a uh, an international traitor, you know, a prisoner. We want to send them into pure, proper isolation where we can send them to this capsule here. Pretty, uh, pretty dark, really, when you think about it, isn't it? Now, how is our altitude for the plane doing? So it's to 78, so it's still within the border of space. We haven't lost it yet. I do believe we have some amount of time after it enters the atmosphere to um, gain control of it. So actually, we need to be going to an eccentric orbit here because we need to be able to switch back to the jet and have this satellite in a circular orbit. It's not going to be a bit inefficient here. Just trying to get ourselves into a... Okay, that is a stable orbit in space. So we will leave it for the moment and switch back to the jet. Ooh, I feel like that was close. I didn't. I don't remember. I, I was clicking very quickly. But did that say 71 kilometers altitude? Whew! Cut it even closer somehow than I managed to for the previous flight. Oh! Less than a kilometer of safe space to go. So now we can close the cargo bay and set our landing point. Which, uh, yeah, let's just go back to the desert airfield. <laughs> I said at the beginning of this video I wanted to showcase kind of weather with this mod. Well, with the volumetric clouds mod, I should say. So. Still bad weather at the runway. Be a great place to go so I can showcase it. So we're going to drop out of live commentary mode now and go back to editing, Matt. And I can finally address kind of what might be a bit of an elephant in the room with this second mission. And that is the UI is a bit cut. I don't know why, but the recording wasn't a perfect 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Like if I just remove the crop for a second, you can see we've got these black bars above and below the footage, which are looks kind of annoying and I felt like if we just cut back to the cropped version I feel like it looks better with the crop because the bits of the UI that are cropped out here they're not super essential because you can see the Delta V at the top in the uh, Kerbal Engineer Redux readouts and that's really the only bit of information that's sort of missing from the UI on the left there you can't see the stock Delta V gauge and that's it everything else is sort of there it is all readable so I, I felt like having no black bars was better than having the black bars. Anyway, we are just on our way back to the desert airfield. I did consider, oh, wouldn't it be kind of neat to go back to the Kerbal Space Center or the island runway, you know, somewhere other than where we launched from. But A, this is the military version of the satellite launcher. So this is a, a, an X plane that like the public doesn't know it exists. 
to, I guess, even though we're using it for commercial space flight as well. But not with the military logos and iconography on it. So I feel like it always has to launch and return from the secretive desert um, military runway base, even though it's not a military base in, in Kerbal Space Program, like Canon, but whatever. And B, I said that I wanted to showcase the bad weather that is featured in Black Rack's Volumetric Clouds mod. And, of course, we know it to be bad weather at the um, <laughs> desert airfield runway. So I felt like it was an appropriate place to return to. And, you know, we might spend quite a bit of time flying around in the bad weather, because unlike the Kerbal Space Center, I'm not actually that familiar with the location of the desert airstrip. Like, I've obviously activated navigation on the map screen, so it's highlighted on the nav ball, but I don't actually know where it specifically is in relation to landmarks and identifiable land masses. So really, I was just flying low, scanning the ground through the rain, trying to find the landing strip. And I was like, oh, here's a little POV, I guess, of the Kerbals. And then, lo and behold, there is the runway. Now, we're coming in at completely the wrong angle, and we haven't really got enough time to course correct to land from this approach. So what I'm going to do now, now we have located the runway, we're going to throttle up a little bit, I, both by using the throttle gauge and by intermittently turning on two additional rapier engines, like there. Uh, and we're going to swing around and try and make a landing that's a little bit more successful than the previous one, i.e. we don't overshoot the runway. Yes, I know I, I know I pretended that it was all fine, but... I, obviously it wasn't, you guys watched the video right, but hey, look at the storm! Wow! Isn't that so cool? It's so much cooler than flying, like, not in a storm. I mean, it would get annoying if it was, like, all the time, but hey, maybe it's just the novelty hasn't worn off for me yet because I haven't flown through storms very much in Kerbal Space Program, but yeah, wow, isn't that cool? And here we are, making our approach. Now, I'm keeping the air brakes deployed as long as possible, but we will need to retract them when we make our touchdown because those lower air brakes will get destroyed um, because they're, they extend too low basically. So now we're retracting the air brakes. We are very close to the end of the runway though. I have deployed the parachutes in a desperate attempt to slow down and we can quickly whack up the braking power of those rear wheels and it was all fine. As you can see, we, you could park a bus in the gap between us and the end of the runway. Now I'm not done talking about the jet launch just yet. I will be cutting back to it in a second. Have another look at that beautiful storm that's going on. But of course, I want to just finish off the mission with our polar spy satellite. So I'm just going to put ourselves, well, I aimed for a 100 kilometer orbit, which I then, I, I slightly overcooked my burn. So now we're going to aim for a 101 kilometer orbit. So our apoapsis is all set. And so we can perform a burn at Apogee. And then there we are, pretty much circular eyes, almost completely circular, in fact. So I was very happy with the uh, final location of our spy satellite, which I've named PS1, because, you know, Polar Satellite 1 is the first one in this universe. There wasn't a lot of creative thought put into that name, guys, to be honest. Now let's cut back to this storm, because it's not just the visuals that are amazing, but it's also the sound design. Like, listen to that. And see how when we're inside the vehicle, I know I'm talking and covering it up, but when we're inside the vehicle, you can hear the sound hitting the outside of the airframe. It's just like in real life. It's amazing. It's so cool. Just as cool as the names on the right-hand side of the screen there. Of course, my Patreon supporters and my YouTube channel members make all of this content possible, as well as our amazing sponsors. Thank you once again to Boot.dev for sponsoring. It really is such a cool idea. I've been playing around with myself, and I've like I've been having a lot of fun, basically. So click the link in the description box. And of course, use my code MATLAND to get 25% off your first month or your entire year if you choose the annual plan. But the video is over now, so thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.